blue go live button just turned blue and so I'm hitting it. And we're live. It is Friday, December 3rd, 2021, 5.03 p.m. Eastern time. And we are not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have Noah Hoffman, two-time Olympian in cross-country skiing and anti-doping advocate and a student at my alma mater, Brown University, uh, on the show to talk to us today. And so it's really nice to see you, friend. It is like really great to see you. I'm like, I was so happy when you went to Brown. And so like, I'm glad to see that you're like happy there and doing well. So I'm excited to catch up a little. It's so great to be here. And yeah, you are, uh, you and Oakley Olson are uh, the reason that I am here at Brown. So I feel like I owe so much to you. Yeah. I remember like that night that we like sat down and I was like, oh no, there's like a resumed undergraduate program at Brown. But like, I don't even know if you'd qualify for that because you never started. <laughs> I was like, I guess uh, kind of tell us about how you became, like how you found out that you had an aptitude for cross country skiing. And then like kind of how you picked the sport and went into it. Yeah, so growing up in a mountain town in Colorado, uh, everybody skis. I grew up in Aspen. Um, and I was a I was a very focused kid. I in fifth grade I would run laps around the track during recess because I actually I couldn't tell you why I did that, but uh while everyone else was playing on the playground, that's what I was doing. Um and I this was checks really... out, by the way, this like is completely <laughs> in keeping with your incredibly earnest personality that you would be like, fun. That doesn't sound like something I should be having. I'm going to go run laps. Like... <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And I, um, it's funny. I have a two year old nephew now who uh, is exhibiting a little bit of the same tendency that I have to um, to kind of like um, be look at the world in a very orderly way. Um, so as part of that, for me, I uh, I didn't really care what sport I got into. I just wanted to be the best in the world at something. Um, and cross country skiing was a pretty easy path uh, in Aspen because for two reasons. One is we had just had a former Olympian move back into the Valley and take over the head coaching job when I was getting serious around ninth grade. Uh, the second reason is that cross country skiing is one of those sports that rewards you almost one-to-one -one with how much effort you put into it. Um, and I was willing to put in a whole lot of effort. Uh, and so um, I, it was just so, it was, I was, I was getting, you know, immediate rewards um, and the harder I trained, so the better I, I did. Explain that. What, what, what is the, uh, what is the distinction you're making? What are sports that don't reward you for effort commensurately with the degree of effort almost every other sport i would say um <laughs> so so how is it done uh, in that it is so, so i should say that there's a threshold of like you have to have a certain aptitude for endurance sports you have to have a certain body type but but once you hit that threshold um because it is basically entirely your success is entirely based on your aerobic capacity and your aerobic capacity is one of those things that you can train and the harder you train, as long as you don't overtrain yourself, the better you're going to get. Um, and I also was lucky to have like a huge tolerance for really high training loads. It wasn't until the last two years of my career that I found my limit and absolutely destroyed myself. But I had to find that limit and it took me 15 years to do it. And I had a great career in the meantime. So to answer your question, Ben, um, figure skating would be like the furthest you could possibly get in winter Olympic sports from one that is giving you success and commensurate to how much ben, you're you muted. Yeah, but I, so so I, that's what I'm having trouble with. I look at a figure skater, and I did a little bit of figure skating at one point. Um, I look at a figure skater and say, uh, these are extreme technical skills. Um, uh, the only way to get them is to train extremely hard. People aren't born knowing how to find edges. They're like... Um, uh, so granted, it is not a simple matter of uh, cardiovascular load capacity, but it is a pretty simple function of the development of certain technical skills. Uh, I can understand like basketball where there's like, okay, 
if you're not seven feet tall, you're at a disadvantage relative to the person who is seven feet tall. But I don't. I guess I'm not sure I understand why figure skating is a counterexample that in your mind to what you're describing, it just seems like a training to a different thing. Maybe. So I think the, the, the distinction is what I'm talking about is being able to put in work without very good or very much direction. Um, I was uh, speaking of, of doping, which we'll talk about a lot later. I was a huge fan of Lance Armstrong. I would watch the Tour de France in the late 90s. Me early 2000s. too. And I would go out and, and I, I was emulate. convinced he was clean. <laughs> and I've never recovered from being duped by that motherfucker. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we, we swear sometimes in the show, Noah. <laughs> fair, fair, fair enough. And I, uh, I, I actually would say I haven't either. And that has driven my post skiing career in to a large extent. But um, to get back to my point, so I would, I would go out and emulate. I would go out on 120 mile long road bike rides by myself in ninth grade because that's what I saw the Tour de France doing. And you know what? It made me a hell of a lot faster in road biking, running, and skiing, which are my three sports. Had I been a figure skater and I watched, even if I was watching tons and tons of elite figure skating, yes, I would have gotten better with ice time, but without direction, without good coaching, I would not have made the type of improvements and a one-to-one -one ratio that I did in endurance sports. That's what I'm That's That is like such an interesting, huh? That is like, I think that that's, do you think that, well, we can get into this later, but I that, that I think that I now I get what you're saying now. So, did you have? I mean, it also seems like I mean you were in Aspen. It wasn't like you were wanting for people to coach you in the technique of cross country skiing. Um, so, at what you said is you were like talking about like 120 mile bike rides in ninth grade sounds insane. But you picked how? How did you pick cross country skiing? Was it kind of the the least amount of competition, your best performance, or? No, I've thought a lot about this in the in in kind of relation to how sports you know can be governed in this country. I didn't actually choose until like junior or senior year of high school. I was not sure whether it was going to be road cycling, running, or cross country skiing because they all right they all have that same feature of 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 you know the same skill set. I was getting better at all of them. I won state championships in cross country running. I was winning races in road biking. I was obviously improving as a cross country skier, but it was. Um, it was the governance format of cross country skiing that was very, very black and white. You there's there's a progression level where you you ski well in the local races and then you get to go to the statewide races. You ski well the statewide races, you get to go to the national races. You ski well the national races, you get to go to your first international races. And you ski well the international races, you get to make the World Cup and then the World Championships, the Olympics. It's like a straightforward path from being a, a 10 year old dreaming of this stuff straight to the Olympic games in road cycling. You have to get noticed by teams. you got to get picked up. you got to, you got to know people um, mm -hmm. in running. So it felt like the most college. meritocratous in some way. Like it just kind of was like, it was like, you didn't need coaching. You didn't need to be plugged into sponsors. You didn't need to be plugged into like some type of infrastructure. You could just as an individual go out there and compete. And if you did well, then you went to the next level. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that it, it, it now that you put it that way, it's like a lot like my mentality in, in training, which was to bang my head against the wall and voila, I saw results. You do that in cross-country skiing, in, in running or in road biking, you have to know people, you've got to build relationships, especially road biking. You've got to spend years as a domestique before you can be the team leader and going for your own results. That's not true in cross-country skiing. You can just go try to win. Huh. It's super interesting. I mean, it's funny too, because I feel like cross country skiing is not one of the most, maybe it's because it's, it's a hard sport to watch over time. Like, right. Because like you can't, it's hard to follow people around the track. It's like depending, you know, just generally it's like difficult logistically. Um, but even putting that aside, like me, I, it does seem like a pretty, like it would seem like a pretty, in some ways, even though it's typically Scandinavian, it seems like a pretty, um, that type of, that type of, ascension seems very american in a certain way yeah and it probably is an easier ascension to make in this country um at least it was when i was young because we weren't that good internationally and so if you if you if you had the results domestically you'd get the start spots internationally whereas if you're in norway you really need to be one of the top 15 skiers in the world if you're even going to get a start spot um in most of the international competitions 
And so like, I think it would have been a harder, harder to break through onto that elite level had I been in a place where skiing is really big. So how do you end up making the Olympic team? Like from, and how old were you when you made the Olympic team? I was 24 in Sochi and 28 in Pyeongchang. Um, so by the time, by the time I, I was close, close-ish, I had an outside shot at making the team in Vancouver in 2010, but I would have needed some really good results. By the time Sochi came around, I was the best skier, best distance skier in the country. And I, I was not focused on making the team. I was focused on going there to, to win medals. Um, which I did not do, not even close, but it was, that was still my goal. And so um, it was not about making the team. It was, uh, but I mean, to answer your question on a technical standpoint, certain people qualify based on their like consistent results over the two years prior to the games, um, which is how I qualified. Um, Actually, that's how I qualified in Sochi. I qualified in Pyeongchang, the second route, which is when they don't fill the team, I was skiing much slower uh, in 2018 than I was in 2014. When they don't fill the team based on the people who are skiing well consistently, then they have a national championships and the top skiers from national championships qualify. That's how I qualified in Pyeongchang. Cool. Um, ben, go ahead. So I'm interested in the psychology of a sport that is uh, high profile in some parts of the world, but low profile here. I think the classic example is, you know, luge or skeleton or something, right? Where, what do we have five tracks in the entire country? Um, uh, and the number of people who, who, you know, to do it here, you have to be uh, somehow captivated by uh, something that is much more popular elsewhere than it is here. I, I just countries. like, there is, do you know Lauren, have you ever heard of Lauren Gibbs, Noah, by any chance? She so. was, she was in my class at Brown and she was just like a badass track and field person, but never did that much with it. And she just stayed in shape and did CrossFit and did a bunch of stuff. And she was recruited to, to Ben's point. Sorry to interrupt Ben, but she was recruited to Ben's point. Like, I don't know, we were like 10 years out of college, like to do bobsled for like the women's bobsled team for like the US. Um, and she like, I, I mean, like, I think they did pretty well. I don't remember what happened. But anyways, it just reminds me of like kind of this story. Like it was like all of a sudden on Facebook, she was on the Olympic team, having never done bobsled before in her entire life. Like it was just amazing. <laughs> so so I, I, um, I'm just interested in the Winter Olympics is kind of full of these sports, but there are some of them in the Summer Olympics as well. Um, what's the, um, what is the sort of domestic profile of a cross-country ski racer uh, in the United States? Is it... It might um, be regional based on whether he's in Colorado or like Vermont or like New Hampshire or versus everywhere else in the country. Sure. But but I, I mean, it's a very strange thing to have this to have this uh, field that is in, in which you're nationally competitive, that you go to, you know, one of the biggest sports events in the world uh, that a lot of people watch. And yet generally speaking, people really have only a dim awareness that the competitive field exists other than that. Yeah, it is a little bit, um, a little bit like living in two worlds, I think. And, and so you see it like in Aspen, there's a, there's a daily, there's actually two daily papers in Aspen. And I was in the paper all the time because they write about their athletes. We, Aspen said, I mean, it's a tiny town but we sent 12 or 13 athletes to Sochi. It was like a huge contingent of the Olympic team was from Aspen. So in Aspen, you're like, you feel like you're sports. Genetically, individual. like people, do, I mean, do you think that there's just like more people who are athletes and have children and like live in Aspen? Definitely not genetically. It's got to do with the money and it's got to do with the, oh, that's true. the, the very quality expensive. of people, the type of people, yeah. very expensive. So for one, these sports are expensive, especially alpine skiing. 
Um, and then for two, you have to, you know, there's not that many places in the country to do these sports. You have, like Ben said, there's not a, there's not a sliding track in Aspen, but there is great cross country ski trails and there's great Alpine mountains and there's an incredible trade park. The X games are held there. So you get lots of free skiers and snowboarders coming out of Aspen. Um, so it's access. It is lifestyle. There's a very active lifestyle. So every, I mean, we had ski days during high school and like out of my 120 person class, there were like five people who would choose like the indoor option during the ski day. Everybody else skied. So everybody's, you know, we had a chairlift from our public high school onto the mountain. So like senior year of high school, I would have, I had first two periods off. I would come to the class, you know, come to school at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. and lift weights because the cross country ski or the, the ski club was right across the parking lot. So I'd lift weights change into my snow pants, take the lift up, ski all morning, come down, go to two classes in my snow pants, go back across to the clubhouse, train for two hours and ride my bike home at 5 p.m. That was my lifestyle. Um, and my parents didn't have to be involved at all. The school was free. The The ski club was subsidized. We lived in employee housing. It was just absolutely, you know, the type of, of uh, place for your kids to grow up, for me to grow up that you just can't even dream of. <laughs> yeah, um, that's completely that, that's insane. why why you end up with with 12 Olympians. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. So I want to ask about um a different kind of skiing before we uh move on to doping. Um uh my we recently had my uncle um on the show who is a uh somewhat famed uh backwoods skier um in uh very remote rural Montana. Um, and I'm, I'm curious about, you know, backwoods skiing is kind of a hybrid of downhill and, or Alpine and, and, uh, and, uh, and cross country skiing. I'm curious about, uh, what the crossover is among, uh, among cross country ski racing people with, this kind of, you know, scary, crazy backwoods skiing culture? Um, all I do these days is backcountry ski. I have actually really? not Wait, cross really? country skied in two years. Whoa. <laughs> really, um, Noah? Because I remember you reti retiring and I was like, this is like, you can't, I, I remember like laughing to myself when you said retire. I'm like, you have to come up with a better word for it than that. Even though it made sense and I got it. Like, it was like, I was like, you're just so young, like to be walking around saying you're retired. Um, but there's, uh, wait, you like went on a, like a, like a three hour cross country ski the day you retired. I think you've, have you? What are you doing? So wait, you're doing backcountry? Does that mean that you're doing like hella skiing? Are you like doing skins? Like, how are you? Are you like, is it telly? Like, how are you? What are you doing? Uh, no, I mean, just just for fun. This is like the type of skiing that I always wanted to do during my career. You get is to go like like alpine skiing on big terrain in the mountains um, that you, I could never do. We, I spent 15 years traveling to some of the greatest ski venues in the world, alpine ski areas, um, incredible, you know, mountains all over Europe and Asia and okay, never so, got so to explore. Wait, before you go on, we're getting some requests in uh, in the chat to define terms. Backcountry skiing is generally, and uh, Noah, yeah. correct me to the extent yep. that I get this wrong, uh, The it is done on uh, basically an alpine ski with a loose heel uh and you lay skins on the surface of the ski so that you can go forward but not backward you climb mountains on skis and then ski down them is that a fair a fair account yeah that's essentially correct you uh although when you ski down you lock your heel down so when you ski down you're yeah. just alpine skiing what you think of when you take a chairlift up this is just a different way to get up the mountain a much cheaper way as it may be also much more dangerous because it's not avalanche controlled so people die in the backcountry all the time in avalanches yeah we were talking about that with his uncle and like john obviously like john used to go well, john was almost killed by an avalanche and his wife was killed by an avalanche sorry that's john is his uncle not my john with who you know no but, like, no my my, my uncle. john my john used to go in march to washington state and to like a bunch of mountains up there and do backcountry skiing and 
the Marchness of it always made me really nervous. It was like cheaper for all of them to go skiing and get like a big, like a big lodge and like kind of do the ski. But like it made me, like you, you'll understand like the sun at that time of year like changes how the snow acts and it like used to make me so nervous and i would make him call me from the landline in the cabin like every day when they finish skiing so because i was so nervous about it but like i didn't know that that's what you've been doing so where have you gone like what kind of stuff have you gone have you gone back to some of the places that you used to cross country ski no unfortunately not i i mean part of the reason we've been backcountry skiing and not alpine skiing on the mountain is that it's free to backcountry ski with the exception of paying for abbey education and things like that um I, you know i'm a college student i didn't make very much money during my ski career brown is we can talk about this if you want brown is paying for my education which is amazing um but i don't have a lot of money to to go buy lift tickets so so we backcountry ski and during covid my partner and i lived in southern oregon um, I took really? classes remotely for the year um, when Brown was offering remote classes and she was working at the Planned Parenthood clinic there and we were skiing on volcanoes all over Northern California and Southern Oregon. So that's where mostly where we've been skiing. No wonder I didn't hear from you in like a year. That sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds incredible. That's really great, Noah. Um, ben, do you want to switch us over to talking about doping or do you have any more backcountry questions? Uh, no, so I, I, I actually wanted to finish my my backcountry question, which is, you know, when should we assume that you're an example of a larger pattern that the, the, the people who are cross country ski racing are kind of recreationally backcountry skiing or are or is or are they kind of two separate cultures that, that you're bridging? There's a huge amount of crossover and it's geography specific. So in places like Aspen and the Pacific Northwest, so anywhere up in Colorado, Pacific Northwest, uh, there's a huge amount of crossover between these communities in places like the mid, the upper Midwest and New England, where there's a huge cross country ski scene. There's not a very big backcountry scheme because there's not mountains or there's really shitty snow like in the Northeast. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. I want to tell you my uh, performance enhancing drug psychodrama, which is that I grew up as a fanatic baseball fan. And then in the early aughts, when all these great baseball records fell to people who were obviously doping, um, I stopped being able to watch baseball and have never watched baseball again. Um, and I switched to what I thought was the sport that was, uh, they were clearly trying to do something about it, uh, which was cycling, um, which doesn't, isn't as crazy as it sounds. They were testing everybody, every race. There was, uh, you know, a, 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 there was a serious effort going on. And besides, there was this legendary figure going for, you know, seven tours in a row. It was really exciting. And when Lance turned out to be a charlatan, um, I just stopped being able to watch sports, period. And uh, my view now is if I don't know the person or at least one person competing personally, uh, it's strangers, uh, strangers competing over who has the best doctors. Uh, and um, and so I'm I'm and I literally, other than occasionally socially being somewhere where people are watching sports, I just don't do it anymore. Um, and I, I'm, I'm interested in your sense of it as somebody who's been in the, uh, who, who's been in in the community, who's been, um, uh, uh, you know, how, uh, how wrong am I? Like just to assume that the incentive structure, the incentive structure is so pro doping that there's no reason for a person on the outside to look at any athlete and assume that they're clean. I think you're quite wrong. And I think that the bigger, so I mean, it, for for a little bit of context, right? This is this is kind of 
I pivoted hard to this when I retired from skiing. So I work now, I do contract work with the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency, educating athletes about their rights and responsibilities under the World Anti-Doping Code, about what it's like to get tested, about what they have to do. Um, I am a member of the uh, glo a new uh, athlete advocacy group called Global Athlete, and our entire mission is to pressure the International Olympic Committee and the World Anti-Doping Agency um, to, to be better at their jobs, um, to, to, to serve athletes better, to serve the broader public better. And the biggest issue facing world sport from a doping perspective right now is not individual athletes like Lance Armstrong. Um, the testing has actually gotten so sensitive in the last decade that we're now catching individual athletes who are taking substances completely unintentionally um, through food yeah. products, through supplements. Um, we saw this at track and field this summer. Um, it's, you know, and the, oh, then there's, there was the marijuana issue, but there was also the um, the pork. Wasn't it like, burrito. yeah, the pork. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think, Ben, that we, I think, Ben, that countries that are not instigating institutional doping that the majority of their athletes are clean um but the the elephant in the room is right in line with all of the work that you do ben um at lawfare which is um this is a this is a geopolitical it's a state issue it's yeah. a state issue now um and uh it's a state issue it continues to be a state issue with russia um, there is a discussion about a lot of other authoritarian, powerful countries um, that are instituting similar type schemes to what happened in Russia. Um, there is no reason is it, just to believe that... Just, just to explain it for people, like it's, it's propaganda, right? Like, it, like having successful world-class athletes is like oh, it's, a propaganda... It's it's Putin, Putin, Russia invaded Crimea three days after the conclusion of the Sochi Games, after the 50K that I was in when they swept the podium, uh, thanks to drugs. All three of those athletes were, were wrapped up in the state-sponsored doping scheme in Russia. Um, they, I was in the lead pack for 49K, and they skied away from the final group, swept the podium. The award ceremony for that Olympics was sorry for that race was at the closing ceremony they they wait and present medals at the closing ceremony you've got three russian men on the podium you've got putin there in attendance you've got an incredible amount of national pride you've got an incredible amount of international attention and then you invade crimea three days later and those things are it, not disconnected so uh this is an area where you so know well said. it is it is it is an area where propaganda and frankly covert action come together in a remarkable way if you have not i'm sure you have noah for those of you who have not watched the movie icarus um which is uh about exactly this at sochi um uh do it is it is really uh you know, at the time the movie came out, I wrote in Lawfare that this is actually the best movie about Russian interference in the U.S. elections that's ever been made because it's not about it at all. It's about some other process to corrupt using covert actions and, and means. Um, and, you know, there are a series of conversations that I had with the filmmaker, uh, um, uh, Brian, um, uh, on the Lawfare podcast that are, you know, worth listening to in light of what Noah is saying. Noah's describing the athlete side of it, but this really was a geopolitical statement being made that had, you know, for which they were using the instrumentalities of covert action. And they, 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 created, I mean, holes in walls to pass samples, uh, fake. I mean, it was a remarkably sophisticated set of operations. 
Yeah, the hardest. So uh, uh, I'm, I'll elaborate a little bit. I can elaborate as much as you want. I had the opportunity to, to interview for I host the Global Athlete Podcast, and I had the opportunity to interview Dr. Gregory Rodchenkov this summer, who was the mastermind behind the entire thing. He's the subject of Icarus, um, and he uh, and he amazingly was, still alive. And amazingly still alive. I, and there's a whole bunch of things about that. So we worked really hard from 2019 to 2020 to pass the Rodchenkov Anti-Doping Act, which was signed into law reluctantly by President Trump after passing both houses of Congress unanimously last December. We're coming up on the one year anniversary of that. Um, that was in response to the fact that the things that Ryadchenkov was reporting on were not criminal acts in the US and therefore he was not subject for, he was not eligible for witness protection. His witness protection has been entirely privately funded um, because of that uh, kind of loophole. So the Ryadchenkov Act fills that loophole it brings the power of federal law enforcement to the fight for clean sport. Uh, um, importantly, it does not criminalize doping for athletes specifically. That was done both to bring people along because there's would have been huge resistance to criminalize doping for athletes, but it was also done because as I was saying to my initial answer to your question, Ben, the current anti-doping system actually does a pretty decent job of catching individual athletes. The problem is these state sponsored international schemes. And this is what the Rodchenkov Act is focused on. Um, it criminalizes any doctor, coach, administrator, government official who facilitates international doping. It does not criminalize it for athletes. So that was part of this process. And so, then, so, yeah. so, so question, we're going to have a Winter Olympics in China and everybody's, uh, uh, everybody says, you know, we should be you know, boycotting because of Huang Shui or, or, you know, or some political statement. But why isn't China in exactly the same position visa other than having a much less elite athlete core in the Winter Olympics than Russia does? But uh, leaving that aside, there seemed to be in exactly the same position that Russia was in vis-a-vis -vis Sochi, which is you control the environment, you can get away with all kinds of stuff. Uh, why should anybody have confidence in any Chinese athlete's performance in this coming Winter Olympics? I don't have an answer to that. Yeah. Um, no. So, that I, is, so, I, so wait, but that's a really interesting distinction that you're making. Um, well, let, you're, let me because quickly. your answer to my original question, which is, you know, should I watch? sports and have confidence in that any given athlete is clean is you couldn't be more wrong. Um, I, but the individual, that's what your answer is at the individual level, but at the state level, your answer is there's no reason to have confidence in any Chinese athletes performance in, in, in you know, in a couple months in Beijing. That's a really remarkable statement. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so one thing I want to highlight, I want to highlight the, what I think is the most interesting thing that Dr. Rodchenkov told me in August when we talked, which was that the crucial element to being able to pull off what Russia did in Sochi was having their own laboratory, their own WADA accredited laboratory. Now, most that there's actually not that many WADA accredited laboratories in the world, um, but there is one in Moscow and there is one in Beijing. Um, and it is, I, I think that any country that has their own WADA accredited laboratory um, and an authoritarian state with uh, the type of incentive structure that Russia and China have um, is not going to be effectively, uh, effectively disincentivized from doping in the international system. I, I kind of... I want to talk for a second. I, I know that like everything you were saying has like huge impacts on like kind of geopolitics and kind of a, a lot of the stuff that Ben writes about and a lot of the stuff that you've referenced. But I kind of also just because I'm your friend and have known you for a while, want to talk about kind of the impact that this had on you personally as like an athlete who didn't dope and kind of what you've gone through emotionally and psychologically. Um, you've always been like so adamant about this. And I remember, I forget, you're gonna have to forgive me, I forget his name, but I do remember that there was like one person in particular that had been on your team and got caught doping and you like went out on a limb and were like, no way he didn't do it. And then there, it kind of had flipped. And I know that that was hard for you. I mean, like, do you have kind of like, I mean, Ben has one level of cynicism. Like, 
I never think of you as a cynical person, Noah. Like you're a really earnest, hardworking person. I feel like you always believe in kind of like the goodness of people and like that they're going to come through and that most people don't do the wrong thing. And in fact, it's really interesting to me that you draw this distinction between individual and state because I think that that's like in keeping with that. Um, but like, what does it feel like as an individual, like to kind of like have worked really hard and to have been at 49K in that race and then like have gone through that? Yeah, so the frustrating thing was that those three Russian athletes, among with a couple of others, finished ahead of me on the world ranking list that season, the 2013-14 season. And I finished 31st on the world ranking list that season and top 30 qualify for the U.S. ski team's A team. And the U.S. ski team's A team receives twenty five, approximately $25,000 worth of funding that the B team does not. And I was named the B team because I was 31st and not top 30. Um, and all of those Russian athletes were ahead of me. And uh, I never got that funding. And when the doping was, uh, when the doping was revealed a couple years later by Dr. Rodchenkov and by the Stepanovs who blew the whistle before Dr. Rodchenkov did, um, it was too late for me to get, you know, and it's not just me, right? This is happening all over the world where like these ranking lists that, that aren't really part of the, the results you see on a day-to-day -day basis, they matter. They matter for team selection. They matter for start lists. They matter for funding. Do um, people talk about their methodologies for those ranking lists, by the way, or is it like, just like, no, not really, or does it not No, matter? I think like the US ski team is relatively transparent about why they select that and what they do. Um, Sorry, that was one of the questioners coming in. We're just, it has great. to do this weird thing. Sorry, I didn't mean yeah. to distract you. No, no, no problem. Um, so that was one area I was affected. Another one was uh, this athlete. Um, his name is Johannes Dwer from Austria, was a, a good friend of mine. Um, he finished uh, one of the best races of my career was at the Tour de Ski in 2014 in January. Um, it was a point to point race from Cortina, Italy to Toblock, Italy. I, I mean, it was, everything came together for me. It was one of those days that you dream about as an athlete that, that um, I just, you know, I couldn't make myself hurt. It was like all of my training coming together and I, I couldn't believe that anybody had possibly skied faster than me. Well, Johannes was the only athlete that skied faster than me and he skied faster, he skied a minute faster than me in a Whoa. race that was under two hours. I mean, he just destroyed me. Wow. Um, a month and a half later, we were sitting, I was actually eating breakfast with him the morning before the 50K in Sochi, that same race I've been talking about, um, we were chatting. I went out. I said goodbye. We were chatting about his son, whose name is Noah, kind of coincidentally, um, his like six month old son. Um, we uh, went out and did training. I didn't see him again. I came back from training, checked out my phone. And the headline was, Yo uh, you know, at Austrian athlete Johannes Dwer, test positive for EPO, sent home from the Olympics. All of his results are nullified. He'd been taking EPO all year long. Um, it was, uh, you know, so, so I had, you know, the answer was that actually in that best race of my career, I was the best in the world, but I didn't get to experience that on the day. Um, or, I mean, like even that much after, like, I mean, at that point, there's other races that have been taken. I mean, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. it's no. like a tragedy. I mean, who wants, I mean, like, I, I don't even know who holds the Tour de France since they've stripped it from, from like, no one knows. Like yeah. this is the whole thing. <laughs> And if there's an athlete in there that did it clean, that was seventh or whatever it is, and all six people ahead of them, I mean, who cares that they're getting awarded the title now? Nobody. They're, the sponsors don't care. The the public doesn't care. So the, the last thing I'll mention is is what you were talking about, Kate, which is my one of my really good friends, uh, Carl Tomjar from Estonia. Oh, yeah. Um, he, uh, we have a very big pro-Estonian contingent on, on this show. Okay. Well, well mostly they, the they, former the former president of Estonia comes on the show. Or is like a big fan of the show. Anyways, go ahead. Okay. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure that. Uh, I mean, this this news story broke in 2019 during the Estonian presidential election, and it actually eclipsed kind of the presidential uh, politics for a little while. It was so big in Estonia. So um, Carl was one of. He, I mean, he's like come over to the states and, and adventured with me in the desert, gone canyoneering and mountain biking and climbing with me. Really close friend. He actually before, so I had retired in 2018. I was at first year at Brown, and he had booked flights over for the spring of 2019 after the season. And I, I came out of my math class at Brown, my uh, algebra one class or uh, calc one class, and uh, my phone is just blowing up. Um, one of the the first text I saw was, 
your friend Carl is a fucking C word. I, I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing on my phone. Um, he was arrested for, for doping in Austria with a, a raid that took down seven other athletes with a German doctor. Um, That's so sad. I mean, and it just kind like, of just ripped me apart. But I think, Ben, this is what I'm talking about, where I'm saying that the system is actually working for these individual athletes. Carl was an individual athlete. He decided to dope on his own. He wasn't. There's a there's a history and a problem with doping in Estonia. But it, it I mean, Carl talks. So long story short, I ended up actually telling Carl that I, I would still go on this adventure with him that spring. I remember um, that. And I thought that was a good I thought that was a good decision, by the way. I, I'm really glad that I did in retrospect, and I, I've kept in touch with Carl a little bit since. And I still consider him a friend. Good people make really bad decisions. Um, but one of the things Carl was talking about was that Estonian skiing was really, really strong in the 2000s when he was coming of age. They had three athletes who were all Olympic champions. They were by far the best athletes in Estonia. And here Carl was, one of the best athletes or the best skier in Estonia potentially in the late 2010s. And his best races are like 30th in the world. And he just felt like that wasn't good enough. And he felt like he had an obligation to, to try to match this level of Estonian skiing that he had seen when he was young. And that was what drove him to go basically figure out how he could be better and how he could break into that next result. And then he talked about how he was racing some of these races where all of a sudden he'd gone from like 30th on the best day to being top 10. And he was feeling guilty while he was skiing these races and getting these splits and knowing he was skiing this fast. And he was feeling guilty that he was doing it with drugs. Um, it really, you know, having one of my best friends go through that experience, go through that experience, having one of my best friends choose to dope uh, really humanized the experience for me. But that's why, Ben, I say that that the individual, the system is working with the individuals. They caught Carl and it caught all these other athletes. But you know what? It has done nothing to stop the state-sponsored doping in Russia. Such a yeah, point. so that's a really interesting point, but it actually undercuts, I think, your earlier claim um, in a way that's kind of heartbreaking. So my original question that you know, is I look at ski, I look at events and I just don't have a lot of confidence that the people that I'm watching are, are not doping. And, you know, I look at football players who are the size of, you know, Sherman tanks and uh, I just instinctively do not have confidence that the system and what you're saying is there's a high probability over time that individual athletes will be caught. But when you're watching a sporting event, that's actually not good enough for exactly the reason that you're describing, um, which is I don't want to know when I see the, you know, the medals presented at this race that eventually I'm going to find out who ran the, the, the fastest honest race. I want to know who wins and and there's something um, there's something actually insufficient about knowing that Carl is caught over time. Um, I actually want him not to have won the race that he won that he won. That's that's a fair point. And I. I, I think my, what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is that like Lance Armstrong getting away with it as an individual athlete for 10 years is no longer possible. But that an athlete, so Johannes got away with it for nine months. Carl got away with it for about two years, um, but they're not getting away with it for a decade. That's, I agree with you. That's not good enough, but it's at least no, a step but in the that, right direction. But it's a hell of an improvement. And it's a, and it's a, it's it creates powerful thing. disincentives too. Like, let's just also like talk about that. Like they're like, I'm, you're not going, I mean, it is something to, to be humiliated. I mean, like I like literally Ben and I, we talk about the career we joke about, like we're both journalists. Like I joke about like the career ending mistake in which like I have gotten the quote wrong or I have like done and like it gives it keeps me up at night thinking that I would ever do something like that and like I don't know what I would do if like I had made a decision to like inject something into my veins and like sat there waiting for it to happen for three hours while they like, kind of did this thing and then like went and did a race like I don't know how it would be a really hard thing to live through and like you know 
Uh, so there's like a lot of, there is a lot of, um, hopefully there like over time it creates kind of a, a, like a, but you're right. It does make the state sponsored stuff all the more real. Um, and I think Christopher has a question about this. We're going to bring Christopher on. Hold on one second. Um, Hey, Chris. Hi, wait, which one? I had a couple of questions. You can just whatever one he hasn't answered yet. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I actually would, would like to hear more about um this this idea um that we um have tests for like uh, marijuana like we mentioned earlier um and Kerry richardson you know was 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 banned from the olympics or disqualified from the olympics for having a joint after she won the race and was had just found out that her biological mother had died and you know so it wasn't like I don't think anyone would argue that that marijuana is performance enhancing un unless you are using it to, you know, dull pain or whatever. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering whether you think that there's going to be m more of a, oh, come on, it's another one, more of a, a relaxation or, or a revising of, of sort of areas where we have n not only false negatives for masking, but for false positives where it's like the the athlete took something or ate the pork or, or took a, took a joint where, you know, it wasn't, they weren't, they were clearly not trying to performance enhance, but the substance is banned and requires a, a, a ban from the games for that. Yeah, no, I think this is, these are really good questions. So I think this is a kind of a reckoning that the international anti-doping system hasn't done yet. And actually, I think it was interesting, Ben, that you've kind of wrapped in professional sports into our conversation a little bit. But the reality is that this, the anti-doping systems in professional sports are very different from the anti-doping systems in international Olympic sport because they're collectively bargained. And the athletes have a real say in what those anti-doping rules look like. And that is something that's missing. So to Chris's question, like marijuana in Shikari Richardson's case is prohibited, but there's a there's a real question about like whether it should be or not. Um, that's different from like the pork burrito case where an athlete is. So so in Shikari's case, she she made a mistake, right? But it, the rules are very clear um, that that marijuana in your system above a certain threshold in competition results in a ban. She got the shortest possible ban because the anti doping authorities, everybody believed her story. It was just that that ban has to include a nullification of the result where the test was taken and that was the qualifying race for the Olympics. And so she didn't qualify for the individual race of the Olympics. That was pretty basic. Um, but whether that should be a rule or not to Chris's point um, is something that I think, I mean, I, I personally believe that marijuana should not be prohibited, even though I think there's also an argument to be made as Chris alluded to, that it actually is performance enhancing in certain sports, in certain situations, particularly uh, I dated a slope style skier for a long time. And slope style skiing is essentially about um, how much you can suppress your nerves um, and how much you can, you can risk, you're willing to risk getting hurt uh, in order, to, um, in order to, to perform at the highest level. And in that situation, uh, smoking a little marijuana might be helpful. Um, now, did that, there are also, there are, there's lots of drugs out there that are, prohibited in certain sports, but not others. For instance, beta blockers are not prohibited in cross-country skiing. They would be the opposite of helpful, but they are prohibited in shooting sports, including biathlon, which involves- I was just gonna ask that. Like biathlon, that would seem like beta blockers would be like incredible. Yeah, but, well, what about 10 meter pistol shooting, which is an Olympic yeah. sport? Um, of course, a beta blocker. So maybe marijuana should be prohibited in certain sports, um, but certainly it should not be blanketly prohibited. Certainly, I don't think it should be prohibited in 100 meter track sprinting like it was for Shikari. Um, so I would like to see in that way a move towards the professional model where athletes have more say in the anti-doping system. Um, and then to Chris's other point about whether, um, whether athletes um, are, whether we're gonna have this this reckoning with athletes testing positive uh, accidentally, I think we absolutely need to. And actually the US anti-doping organization has been really um, proactive in, in pushing for higher thresholds on the low end because the tests have gotten so sensitive. There should be certain positive test results that we just throw out for certain substances. And WADA in a lot of cases just says, WADA being the World Anti-Doping Agency just says, 
no, any positive test for any amount of these substances resulted in automatic uh, suspension of two years or four years or whatever it is. Um, I think it's time that we that we take seriously um, tainted supplements and and food products that are getting certain substances uh, that are testing positive for certain substances like pork, et cetera. Um, so we have Joel, the nudge, uh, who is our like, I think that here, Joel, I have like felt a bond with you since you started watching the show, mostly because you talked about, uh, well, you have you do a lot of cross country skiing and biking, um, but and uh, you do uh, the Berkey, and like no one else ever in my life have I met anyone outside of Putney who understands what the Berkey is. Uh, but there's, uh, <laughs> but We're the um, cool kids, I'm just saying. yeah, you're the you're the cool kids. So, anyways, Joel, go ahead with your question. <laughs> so, I'm gonna try and be quick, mom and dad. I swear, you know, I'm gonna try to be quick, but I, I have a lot. Yeah, you um, have a lot, Mr. Hoffman. First. Uh, thank you so much for coming and being with us today. I've been watching you ski. Uh, thanks, skin, uh, skiing, Vinny, for years, you know. And uh, you've provided such an excellent example for young people in this country. And I, I cannot tell you the value of that. I've been a Nordic coach now for 10 years, and I am the coaching director for the high school mountain bike league in the state of Minnesota. And one of the things that we talk so much about is coaching to character. I can't make a kid do anything, but if I set a team standard that we will be persons of character, character will make you show up to practice. Character will make you try hard when you get there. This issue with substance and cheating and the benefits that it may offer makes it so difficult sometimes to stand by those character and integrity based arguments and people like yourself really provide us a lot of a lot of help and i wanted to thank you for that what i would so i'm, I'm pivoting just slightly how do we help kids understand how to be persons of character and be successful athletes it's a great question. I mean, I, yeah, and thanks, Joel. And I've uh, I've seen you around in the cross country ski world before. Um, I, I mean, I don't know that you can you can teach it. What I what I do want to say is and this kind of goes back to for me to something that you said, Ben, at the beginning, which is like why. I mean, you, you were talking personally, but like why bother with sport at all? And a lot of me, when I left cross country skiing, thought that I was going to just walk away. That I was like, I want to go work on issues of inequity. I want to go work on issues of poverty. I want to go work on the issues of the climate crisis. I don't know exactly what it is, but I want to do something bigger than cross country skiing. And here I am, still talking about international sport. And I think the reason that it's important to me is exactly what Joel said, which is that that as athletes. Um, we have an incredible platform um, and, and can actually, I mean, I, I think like the work that LeBron has done in uh, getting out the vote in underserved communities, um, the work that my teammates have done. So Keegan Randall, um, one of my teammates, Olympic gold medalist with Jesse Diggins in, in her fifth Olympic games in, in Korea, retired the same time I did right after the games, um, was diagnosed with breast cancer two months after retiring from cross country skiing underwent chemotherapy, lost all of her hair, um, and was really public and used her platform to, to just be it, this incredible inspiration for the survivor community, for people undergoing the same thing. A, a huge promote, she worked with the organization Active Against Cancer about the benefits of staying active while you're going through chemotherapy. Just incredible, incredible value. Jesse Diggins, who I know Joel is um, very aware of who come from the Midwest has been an incredible role model because she's come forward about her eating disorders and her struggles as an athlete with with how to how to eat healthily with the pressure to perform at the international stage and the fact that you do when you stop eating or you don't eat enough you see a benefit um, in your performance for a, a short amount of time and then of course you see the health detriments and it doesn't work over the long term. But that that immediate incentive is so dangerous for especially young women, but also for young men. And this is the, so the, the value that Jesse has has found by tr being able to formulate like to to start these conversations amongst young women in this country. These are the reasons that I stay in sport. And, and I think that the more that we can 
contrary to what the IOC wants to do, where they're trying to silence athletes. You know, that one issue I've fought on a lot is Rule 50 of the Olympic Charter, which prohibits athletes protesting or making any political demonstration on the podium. Um, we've, we've just fought this tooth and nail and, and have really gotten nowhere with the IOC. But one of the reasons that I believe that athletes should be able to stand up and use their voice is not only because it, it's an international human right to be able to to speak freely, but also because the value of athletics and the value of sport comes from athletes um, being incredible role models. I think they're, especially as we get into a more polarized world, um, things like what Keegan and Jesse are doing kind of speaks exactly to what Joel is talking about, which is like the ability of athletes to be role models and to lift other people up and to be, and to show young people in this country and old people alike what it's, you know, um, what, what pursuing your dreams look like, what, what it's like to, um, you know, to overcome obstacles. <laughs> You're going to make me cry now. <laughs> like, I'm like, actually, um, but I'm, I'm serious. Like, I think that that's a wonderful thing. First of all, I would say that like sport gets a lot, helps a lot of people out of a lot of bad situations and puts the, gives them a focus and that there is, um, that exercise physical, physically doing anything with your body is something that like kind of is a wonderful, um, escape but it's also kind of like it's it's it it is humanity right like you are doing like this thing um and yeah i just think that what you said is exactly right and the idea that it transforms for you from like i want to do something other than cross-country skiing to like understanding that sport has this kind of much more profound role is i don't know i i do think that you're onto something i you know i mean like i think that that is absolutely true and like the more people that talk about their eating disorders and our Olympic athletes, like is great for women. Like it is way better than just like someone yelling at Facebook about having Instagram, like too much Instagram stuff about eating disorders or whatever. It's like a real solution. And so I think that that's a great point to bring us home. We have Paula, uh, Paula, who is, uh, who is a weightlifter and does Olympic weightlifting. And so Paula, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah. So, um, my governing body is USAW, obviously, for Olympic weightlifting. And one of the things I've noticed is having a governing body that doesn't tolerate doping really changes who dopes. And I think most people wouldn't know this, but like in USA weightlifting, the people who dope actually suck and are like at the top of it because it's not really it's not sanctioned by the governing body. Um, so I was wondering what you think about how not even the state acts, like take away, you know, maybe how USA Olympic Committee might act, but the governing bodies themselves act with their athletes. I think this is so important. And um, yeah, congrats on your success, Paula. I went to- uh, Not, was, not uh, even close <laughs> to the same amount. It's not even close. You don't need to compare. I well, I, I got to I be, don't know, uh, you guys haven't seen the videos of Paula lifting and it's kind of fucking <laughs> awesome. So I just want to say, Anyway. I don't know. I don't know if you were competing in Detroit this summer, but I got to be there at the USADA booth and watching all the um, all of the athletes. Uh, super, super impressive. I love weightlifting as a sport, and I'm actually um, I'm working with the USOPC on their international sport relations, um, basically strategic plan on how they're gonna uh, what what kind of changes they're gonna push for internationally. And the the chair of this board that I'm on is your is the president of USA Weightlifting. So that's been really fun to see. So to your point. Um, I think this is so important because the same thing is, you know, um, Kate, you you kind of had a slip of the tongue earlier when you were talking about Carl. You said you're one of your teammates. And I was like, whoa, oh, whoa, right. whoa, whoa, oh, right. whoa, 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 Yeah, um, I know. I did say that. Sorry. I didn't mean one of your um, good friends. He yeah, no, no. Of course, of course. But um, it, it's uh, there's a culture also like there is in USA weightlifting and USA cross country skiing um, in particular. And I think all of US ski and snowboard in general. Um, that's like like Paul is talking about. That's just completely uh, completely intolerant of doping, and that's so important from an institutional level. If I had wanted to dope during my career, I would have had no idea how to do it. I certainly wouldn't have been able to you know turn to anybody that I normally relied on for advice because they had absolutely no tolerance for doping or for the idea of doping, and that's the type of institutional norms that you have to develop if you're going to get clean sport, but how you can, and so I'm just basically reiterating what you're saying, Paula, is that's so, so important, but I have no idea how, 
you take. I mean, I think you know, you're something... talking about Phil Andrews, correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so I'm from the Detroit area. I didn't get to go to that competition, but like, yes, the USADA booth. Um, I've seen that. I haven't. I was never good enough to, I mean, I got close to getting pulled for like actually having to take a drug test, but I had to take a certification and be inside the random testing pool. And I went with someone as their witness to a drug test. And it's like, they will follow you around the entire competition venue until you go take the drug test. And it, there's like no questions asked whatsoever. They're very, very serious about it. So, so what you're bringing up also is that it, so not only is it these cultures that USA weightlifting led by Phil Andrews and at, at US ski and snowboard led by Travis uh, sorry by uh, um, Tiger Shaw who's who's actually retiring at the moment but it's also uh, what Paul is talking about is the US anti-doping agency which as I said I do some contract work for them but the national anti-doping agencies, which are different in each country, um, are so, so important to clean sport. And, and U.S. anti-doping actually has significant amounts of independence from the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee, which is so important. Um, yes, a lot of their funding comes from U.S. OPC, but there's safeguards in place to make sure that there's no interference. Also, a su substantial portion, portion of their funding comes from the U.S. government, um, which also helps ensure their independence. And it is uh, led by Travis Tiger, who's been just a... A, a kind of a bulldog in the international arena trying to get a system that works against these international doping systems and get that works in the international arena. But it has been very, very strong. I mean, it, it took down the Nike Oregon project with some really impressive investigative work. It took down, I mean, Travis led the organization when it took down Lance Armstrong then. And um, having so what Paul is talking about is, yeah, we show up at all these weightlifting events. We show up at all the cross country ski races. We notify athletes and we, we, you know, we follow the world anti-doping code to a T and we don't let the athletes out of our site until they provide their urine sample to us. Even if sometimes I've heard of weights for athletes who are trying to make weight, who are purposely dehydrating themselves as long as 11 hours to produce 90 milliliters of urine, uh, because these athletes are trying to make weight. Um, but we stick to these rules and, and we do the process when we fund it uh, is really important um, because we in this country believe in clean sport. And yes, we've had absolutely our fair share of dopers in this country. But I think that that role that Paul is talking about of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency in cleaning up the sport in this country cannot be understated. No, we have to leave it there. But this was an amazing hour. I've missed you a lot. And Ben, you're are you muted, Ben? I'm sorry. No, you're not. I just can't hear you. I can't hear you. Can you hear him? Okay. I think your mic's off. Was my, there we are. How about now? Yeah, that's better. I was just going to say, Noah Hoffman, you're a great American. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been such, this so, was fun. so fun. Um, please contact me if you want any copies of my old calc tests from just <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I that was a joke away from... about doping and cheating that was a joke <laughs> oh my god um but no seriously noah you're you're awesome and i am so happy that you've done so well brown when are you graduating friend i'm graduating in the spring and i'm looking at law school potentially well you should talk to you should talk to paula because she's a michigan law school right now and we should talk and yeah and, and you should uh, you know you should be a lawfare student contributor when you're in law school i, I would love that, that would <laughs> <be very fun. laughs> yeah um we will be back many hours from now on monday december we have no idea who the guest is gonna no be. idea who the guest is no idea what's going on we'll figure it out when we get there but um we are not allowed to have fun anymore but in lieu of fun we are allowed to not take drugs so don't take drugs and do sport. That's it. That's all I've got. Sorry, guys.